Welcome to Masters of Regeneration Radio. Conversations with humans who dare to reimagine our place on planet Earth. Earth is changing fast. Evolution happening in real time. An intimate, circular understanding of nature and living systems. We are the land. The land is us. Hi everyone, you are listening to Masters of Regeneration Radio, conversations with humans who dare to reimagine our relationship to planet Earth. What is our purpose? It is to help us all reconnect with an evolutionary understanding of life and with a circular understanding of nature's staggering ability for overflowing self-organization and regeneration. How do we achieve this, you may ask? Uh, well, we do it not by criticizing existing models that no longer work for the planet and life as a whole, but by creating new models, new relationships with living systems that simply make the existing ones obsolete. Our mission at the Masters of Regeneration podcast is to distribute knowledge to the masses for a practical understanding on abundant human living with planet Earth. Welcome to episode 007. <laughs> I'm so excited about this episode, guys. It's um, an episode where we get to celebrate the life of an amazing human being that left us a year and a half ago called Robbie Stewart. Beautiful friend, amazing champion of sharks and life on the planet. And we get to celebrate him with, through talking with Brock Cahill. And um, we wanted to dedicate this episode to celebrating his life and work. Robbie, we miss you so much. And at the same time, we feel your presence so strong and your spirit so alive wherever you are. Thank you for your legacy and thank you for your work. And um, so... We have the pleasure today to have Brock Cahill on the show. Brock is an activist. He's the captain at Team Sharkwater, and he's also the president and founder of the Sea Change Agency. He's the longtime dive buddy and brother in fins of our beloved friend, late Rob Stewart. Robbie always gently reminded Brock that the camera is our greatest weapon in the revolution to save the world. Their escapades have carried them around the globe and through the seven seas on the quest to save sharks and activate humanity. So, arguing that sharks are misunderstood as dangerous creatures, biologist Rob Stewart traveled to the Galapagos Islands, Costa Rica, and other places where the animals can be found and he released with his team an award-winning, life-changing documentary called Shark Water in 2007. Underwater, he fed sharks to demonstrate their fundamentally non-violent nature. With 90% of the shark population destroyed by hunting, indiscriminate hunting, Stewart joined forces with conservationist Paul Watson to fight poachers who illegally kill the animals for their fins and sell the meat to the Taiwanese mafia. If you haven't watched Shark Water, please, it's online, you can rent it, you can watch it on Vimeo or you know a bunch of other on-demand platforms. Please watch it, it's so freaking amazing. These guys go around the world and they go straight at pirates and expose this whole thing. Um, with shark water, they helped to protect sharks, they changed government policy around the world and inspired the creation of shark conservation groups. It's shark water is considered one of conservation's success stories. Rob's second film, Revolution, continued his quest to save sharks in the oceans. Revolution was the first feature film to platform the devastating effects of ocean acidification. 
and climate change was well known, but scientists were just realizing the effects would be much worse than ever imagined. We were and still are in danger of losing the coral reefs and potentially the entire ocean ecosystem, which gives us 60% of our oxygen. Sharks, the top predator controlling the fish populations below them, and the plankton that gives us our oxygen, are being fished to extinction in an ecosystem that sharks have controlled for over 400 million years. Every year, 100 to 150 million sharks are killed, but only half of them are reported, including endangered species. Shark populations have dropped more than 90% in the last 40 years. And with that, the ocean's main predator, marine ecosystems are being destroyed beyond repair. That means no more oxygen for us if we keep down that path. So stay tuned because um, September 7th, we have the, at the Toronto International Film Festival, the premiere of Shark Water Extinction, which continues the adventure across four continents as Rob travels through the oceans to investigate the corruption behind a multi-billion dollar industry. The crew goes through some of the world's most dangerous fishing ports run by international crime organizations that had infiltrated the fishing industry. Sharkwater um, Extinction dives into remote underwater locations to reveal the catastrophic effects humanity has had on the ocean. Illegal overfishing of sharks across the planet has deeper consequences that put the Earth's most important ecosystem in danger of collapsing, which ultimately threatens all of life in and above the ocean. Robbie dedicated his life to conservation and he said, conservation is the preservation of human life and that above all else is worth fighting for. He taught the world to love the oceans and their creatures and not fear sharks through his iconic images of hugging and free diving with sharks and mantas. Robbie passed away while shooting shark water extinction last January 2017. He was a Canadian photographer, filmmaker, and conservationist, and all around amazing human being. He was compassionate, inspired, and he was a lot of fun to be around. We danced a lot and we lost him way too early, but his spirit and legacy live on through his upcoming film, Shark Water Extinction. And I want to thank his friends and his family for all their conservation efforts and for Brock to showing up today and have this awesome conversation you're about to listen to guys. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Robbie together with an amazing group of 40 creative humans at an Unleash the Power Within event with Tony Robbins in, in LA a few years ago. And we had started talking about collaborating on a project and then all of a sudden he was gone. It was so hard to accept that he did just like that when there was still so much to do and so much to create and enjoy uh, for him and for those of us who were lucky to share some life moments with him. So here we go. Brock Cahill on Masters of Regeneration Radio. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, too bad. I was looking forward to seeing your lovely face, but you know. <laughs> you got time. to see it for a second and I saw yours. I didn't see yours. Very I didn't handsome. see you at all. <laughs> no? No, no. <laughs> Unfortunately. I was hiding out the back end. No, I'm joking. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So how are things? Oh, things are crazy, bro, but yeah. they're pretty good. You know, life is... <laughs> it's wild these days, but I'm holding on for the ride. Let's put it that way. For sure. Wild because of everything with shark water or beyond that? Yeah, that, that is a, a big impetus for it, but it spills out into the rest of life too. How so, about you? Where are you at these days? I'm in Mexico City. I was, um, I was in Bogota for six months from January to the end of June. And wow. and then I was like, I need to get out of here. I don't know if you've been to Bogota, but it's like, it's super high up. It's, you know, 2,600 meters. That's, uh, I don't know, like 8,000 feet or something like that. Um, yeah, high altitude. High altitude, polluted, crowded. It rains nonstop. It's very gray. Um, and, and so I left. I went to the Mayan Riviera for a bit, went swimming with uh, whale sharks in Holbosch and 
And I just, nice. like, you know, it was so good. Oh, it was so replenishing. <laughs> but it's really sad what's going on with, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about Tulum and then what's going on with the with the sargassum, with the seaweed invasion is, is pretty appalling. Yeah, it's it's hardcore. And with, uh, you know, the good side of the ecotourism is that the sharks, the whale sharks are not being fished there, but there's a ton of boats out there and it's causing a lot of stress and it's pretty insane. Totally, totally. Yeah. There's a lot of boats. Gosh, it's like a floating city out there. As far as the eye can see, boats everywhere. People like jumping in on top of whale sharks and manta rays. And yeah. It's nuts. Yeah. It is. Um, what was crazy, I wasn't aware of the sargassum seaweed crisis. You know, it was, it was insane. But we can talk about that a little later when we actually get started. Yeah, so um, I've, I've been in Mexico City for about a week, um, seeing friends, screenwriters and artists and just, you know, chilling before I head to L.A. on Wednesday. Um, and I'm just going to be there for a couple, for like 10 days. And then, then Miami, New York, and then I have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to ride, I guess. Yes. <laughs> well, let's do it. You know, I'm fully engaged in the present right now. <laughs> That a boy. Yeah. The only way to be. Yeah, totally, totally. How do you say your name with your accent? Tomas, or how do you say it? Tomas, yeah. Okay, perfect. Which is, yeah, I've been, since I was a kid, it's been pretty confusing because I grew up in France, and so my teachers would always, like, if they didn't know me, they would be like, hey, you're missing an H. Did you forget to spell <laughs> your first name? And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> no. It doesn't, like there's this. no H. <laughs> <laughs> go to h teacher yeah <laughs> how about your last name how do you pronounce your last name i want to ask you cahill? Uh, it's, it's cahill actually cahill. the american way yeah that's cahill. the irish way that you said it yeah cahill you can say it that way I, that, that i get a lot of that too today we have bro cahill on the show yeah that's very irish <laughs> yes <laughs> That would go over well with the homies back in the <laughs> motherland. Is that where you're from? That's where my family's from. I, I was born in the States. Cool. All right. Oh, I'm so excited to do this. And, and I've been just like feeling Robbie really strongly and just uh, missing the shit out of him. Also being, you know, feeling really happy to do this. So. Yeah, that's great, man. Thank you for doing so and helping us spread the word. and continuing his message and his his legacy and i don't know how well you knew him you guys were pretty tight friends well we met we went to a tony robbins unleash the power within thing with, <laughs> cool. do, you know, do you know kishan yes yes so i do kishan put together in like 40 crazy people together and robbie was one of them to to go to this tony robbins thing for three days and you know we were just um so we had a uh like 40 seats just for ourselves and we were called the love tribe and and we we're wearing onesies and it was just like the the insane group of the 9,000 people that were there of course and um and we connected so so much and and you know we would hang out and party in his house in malibu and and we, the rest of the tribe we were pretty pretty tight for a bit and yeah and then um i was sort of i it was like the beginning of this project of of the podcast but i i which i want to turn into a documentary series and so we started talking about it and robbie was like well dude you know as long as it just helps save life on the planet and we can educate people and all that i'm in you know let's do it this was like we were talking and this was november before january you know before yeah death so and then he was like yeah i'm gonna be traveling and on you know talk soon and then that's it that was it yeah so yeah um, man yeah. yeah it's 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 been hard without him for sure and it's just like i'm glad you got to connect with them and see that side and and that's his answer to everything well would it be good for the planet good for life on the planet good for the film let's do it you know yeah it's 
It's a beautiful thing. He always had such a good and stellar attitude and was willing to give time, energy, and resource to whatever he could to make a difference. Yeah. Were you there at Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving party, um, where we made, when we made some geese? I don't know if you were there or not. Uh, I probably was, actually. I don't know if I was there this year. I've been Thanksgiving a few times up at the place in Malibu. I can't remember if I was there this final year or not. I don't know if it was like, yeah, I don't know if it was that 2016 Thanksgiving or the one before. I can't remember. I was definitely at the one before. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we did a lot of, you know, a lot of cooking, a lot of fun parties. Yes. Um, I know he was yeah. getting really tight with that crew that he went to Tony Robbins with and yeah. all that stuff. I, I, he had a, another tribe that was similar and did a lot of full moon parties and stuff like that up there. Sweet. And, yeah, it was the two were starting to conjoin but didn't quite make it all the way there before the untimely departure. Yeah. 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 It's like in a selfish way, you know, like, what the fuck? We're what do you do Robbie you know like there's still so much to do and 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 yet he's so alive in so many ways that's so very true and oh. you know I've been dealing with a uh, pretty severe depression to be quite honest with you Tomas and oh, it's like you know it's been a year and a half now and I've gone through a lot of stuff and carried you know a lot of things forward that we were working on yeah. and just recently I've like almost started to get mad at him, you know, which no. is awful, <laughs> awful and terrible. And, you know, it's, it's all a jest sort of, but I'm like, God damn it, dude, why the fuck did you leave me with this? You know, like, yeah. and, but at the same time, it's, it's a gift and a blessing because of everything that he started and was a catalyst towards. It's just, you know, I miss him so damn much. And I, it was so much more fun when I had him here to do all of it with me. Well, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine. But, I mean, you know, um, we connected so 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 quickly and so deep, and in such a like, fuck, you're awesome. You know, let's hang out, let's do stuff, and let's have fun, and let's be alive, and let's feel alive. And and then it was like in a selfish way, like, what the fuck are you? Why? What? You know, I still just like I think about him and I see his photos, and I'm just it's. And, and I just knew him for, you know, three and odd years or something like that. I, 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 don't, I don't know what it feels for you, like, when you guys, you know, are such old friends and did so many things together. So, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, man. It, it really is. It's, it's heart-wrenching and heartbreaking. And at the same time, like I said, I, it, what he would want out of that situation is not to look at, like, the loss, but all the good stuff that we did have and then what that presents moving forward. I, I feel like he made the ultimate sacrifice because yeah. his mantra was always like, well, would it be good for the film? Okay, let's do it. And I feel like that, oh, this was almost like scripted in some sort of way. Like he made a decision and he, you know, this is not something I would say on the air to anybody else really, but like he almost made the ultimate sacrifice to propel the message forward in, in a way that he knew it couldn't be done any other way. It's crazy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, and uh, I feel that, and I feel that often. And, you know, I was with him the day that he died, and, and I was with him through, throughout that search. And while we were doing the search, we couldn't find him for days. The visibility was really bad in the water. I and know. on that third day, yeah. that third day I made a pro like I just sat down and started meditating on the boat in the midst of all the chaos and the melee that was going on. And I started talking to him, and it was the first time since he disappeared that I actually started talking to him. And he and I had this very unusual way of communicating with each other where we didn't need to use words because we were mostly underwater. So yeah. we'd just speak via energy, as you yeah. can imagine. You know, yeah. like we learned to do it by talking to sharks and then by talking to each other that way. And so I just started talking to him, and we had a conversation, and it was wild. It was just like, you got to let me bring you back. And he said, no, oh. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not coming back, dude. I'm happy where I am. This is this is what I want to do. This is how I wanted to go, and this is it. And I just begged him. I was like, "Please, man, for your family, for your mother, for the rest of the world, to get some closure. You know, otherwise, it's going to be a completely different scenario." Oh my god! And 
he kept refusing and then <laughs> you know as robbie would do like you know like this is it man i'm stoked this is fucking awesome and, oh, man. But, and i was like oh, come on bro and finally he acquiesced and he said okay but you have to promise me that you're going to continue on the mission and you're going to finish our project and i said of course of course I will. You have my word. And the instant that I ha- he had my word, we found him. That exact second. Wow. Yep. Oh, dude. Yeah. And then, you know, it was like, whoa, lightning flash, and he was the, right there. So you were on the boat, and then the divers came up with him? or? Um, yeah, we were using an ROV, actually, a, a remote-operated yeah. vehicle, little okay. unmanned sub. Yeah, yeah. And it ran straight into him. Oh my God. And then, uh, as soon as that happened, like within, within a snap, the guy that was driving the ROV started screaming, everybody get your gear and called me over to the camera and said, is this him? And it was, Oh, oh man. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> what a story. Yeah. It's fucking crazy. You know, it's true. Robbie style. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's, it's got something to it that, yeah. yeah. And, you know, he just, oh, he so... is making sure that the mission continues. He's directing it from afar. Yeah. He, he's got me here to work on it from the ground. And, uh, you know, it's like everybody is banded together in solidarity to make sure that his legacy continues. And it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's so strange. Yesterday, um, while you were telling me about how everything kind of like unfolded and how in a very strange way was scripted. Um, so I'm in Mexico City and my friend who's a famous um, singer in a Mexican band called um, Maldita Vecindad or something like that. He was telling me he knows a lot about the Mayas and the Mayan calendar and all the rituals that they used to do. And he was telling me about the Pelota game. You know that? No. So they used to play with a ball that was like three kilos or something like that, like six pounds, like a six pound football. Mm -hmm. And, and so I knew about it. I knew that they ran like for hours and hours and hours for miles and miles on end. And, but what I didn't know was that there was this other version of the game, which was at a temple and what the it was actually like um like a like a prophetic ritual where they would reenact the solar system the players the players were like a horoscope or the constellations or something like that wow and then they would they would because they they sort of reenacted in real time what the future was going to be like they were ready to sacrifice all of them themselves you know to Cause they were ready. That was it. That was like the end of their, and they had been preparing their whole life for it. It's kind of resonates with what you were saying with Robbie. It's just very, very enigmatic. Yeah, truly. There's a quote from him in the film and I don't know exactly what he saw and what he pictured, but it says in the movie, you'll see it and you'll recognize this clip. He says, I know because it's talking about being scared of dying and something along those lines. And he says, I'm not scared of dying at all. I, I know exactly when and where I'm going to die. <laughs> what? Yeah. And strangely enough, this came up in conversation recently with a mutual friend of ours that he was down in Peru with. And, you know, they were doing some soul seeking and ayahuasca and things along those lines. Yeah. And this girl told me that she vaguely remembers Rob being super freaked out and she thinks that he saw his own death. Oh, wow. And I was like, we need to talk about this a little bit more because I would like to know more about that situation, you know, yeah. and I haven't had a chance to connect with her since then, but it's something that, you know, would be okay. very interesting to know. And if during the ceremony, if, yeah, 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 very possible. <laughs> You know? Very possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I think, you know, I think he understood that we are everything and just dying is just part of the transformation process. And... Truly. And I, I believe he's become even more powerful since he's made 
incredible things happen and made incredible scenes happen before the camera right in front of my eyes where I'm like, that shit just doesn't happen in the world, you know? Yeah, wow. Mm. In particular, on uh, one dive in um, Indonesia, I was at a Rajan pot playing with manta rays. And I'm on an aluminum 80 cylinder tank, and I was down at depth for over two hours. What? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you know about diving, but there's no chance. Like, I've never been on a two hour dive on a regular air tank before. Where, and that I was not a my, breather, it was just a. It was just regular scuba. Regular. Yeah, that I was, was, you wouldn't last hanging, two hours. Nah, no. Yeah. Mostly, you know, even yeah, really well seasoned divers, you know, yeah, I get about an hour or so on an aluminum 80 tank, and I was just blown away because I looked at my watch and I'm like, holy fuck. I've been sitting here talking to this manta ray for two hours. <laughs> and it was oh, raw. And it was just this intense conversation that we had about vulnerability. And it was, it was awesome. It was with an incredible ray? experience. Yeah, with a manta ray. Wow. That's yeah. so amazing. Yeah, it was really weird because while this had happened, I got this strange travel infection and I think I might have literally died the day before myself and I, I like was walking down the gangway and I collapsed and like made it to bed and fell asleep for two days and had this terrible fever and then I woke up that next morning and that's when I was like I don't know am I alive or am I dead it looked like heaven and paradise so I was like who knows it doesn't really matter but I think I can go swimming and, <laughs> and I got in the water with the tank and that's what happened oh my god yeah. This little, this well, first, this old female manta ray showed up. She had a big bite out of her. One of her horns was missing, and wow. it was grandma. My grandma died yeah. last year too, and so she was like, welcomed me in, put me under her wing, and just started swimming with me. And then this young male manta ray showed up and just started doing backflips, 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 backflips. And was like, let's play, <laughs> oh, let's play, it. let's play, let's play. You want to have some fun? Yeah. You know, and that was that was Rob, quite obviously. Oh you know? God. Yeah. It was intense. And then I was like, oh, this is fucking cool. And so we just started playing. We had a good time. And then he started talking to me. And he's like, you've shown up your whole life either as a turtle, which was my spirit animal previously with a lot of protection and a shell on, or yeah. a shark with, with like implements of destruction and weapons. Totally. You know? Yeah. You know? So you know how to protect yourself. You know how to be aggressive. I'm asking you to show up in vulnerability like a manta ray that has no defenses, no weaponry just trust at the right moment that yeah. the right people and the right players will show up at the right times and a ton of grace a, <laughs> and a ton of grace and beauty in the yeah. water. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. You know, and, and it changed my entire life. Oh, that's beautiful. That message of mm. trying to be vulnerable of, of like showing up and being that guy rather than like bracing yourself for impact or a combat or whatever, yeah. you know, yeah. it changed everything. I came home and, I kind of opened myself up and <laughs> it freaked my wife out and she divorced me. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> there yep. you are, open and loving and compassionate and cracked open. Yeah. And then she's like, no. <laughs> yeah. She's like, that's not who I married. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You know, it's, I, I, I bet it would scare the shit out of some people. Yeah, it did. And she, and then she bailed. So it was interesting. And I was like, that's the first lesson. Okay. okay. Awesome. Well, yeah, I guess this was last year. Yep. Wow. That's hell of a year, bro. Yeah. Hell of a freaking year. Everything kind of just got stripped and like pulled away and started over. Same here. Same here, bro. Yeah. With last year. Yeah. <laughs> Really? Yeah, for me it was like, well, came January 2017, I was like, there's a lot of change in the air. I feel like I'm not going to stay in the U.S. and I feel like I'm going to be on the road a lot, but I have no clue what's coming. <laughs> Then Robbie died. Then I launched my documentary worldwide and broke up. And in my three and a half year relationship, like dramatically big explosion and and life just said you're ready for the next level and I'm gonna push you hard towards <laughs> that next level it's not gonna be nice <laughs> yep 
man. Oh my god, so hard, so hard. Incredibly. And then but everything somehow scripted, like, right? Yeah. <laughs> Somewhat that... like it's like I cannot explain how everything has happened, and it's been exactly a year, exactly when you know that eclipse season, like August last year. Yep. Yeah, it's it kind of started anywhere between somewhere between end of June and early August, and it just like. And for me, every the energy just completely shifted uh, yep. on my birthday two weeks ago. Yeah, uh, August first. It was just like, oh, okay, we're coming out a little bit out of that inward journey. You know? <laughs> wow. Yeah. There's some parallelities going on there, bro. Yeah. And the the common ground might be Robbie. You know. Yeah. Helping us both on our way to where we need to be. God, yeah, yeah I get goosebumps. pulling the bullshit off of our backs, even yes. though it's, it might have been painful process. <laughs> so I think all of this is going into the podcast because it's been an amazing twenty-three minute <laughs> rambling. And opening. I didn't know you were recording it. Uh oh! <laughs> it just starts uh, recording automatically, so I'm not even. Well, yeah, yeah, this is all good stuff. You know, I, I didn't know if this is the kind of thing that we'd want to be talking about or not be talking about, but well, I, I mean, think it's just, it's just open and, and, and vulnerable, like you were saying, and, and open hearted and honest, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was the gist of our friend, you know, yeah. always so open hearted, welcoming, generous with his wisdom and with his love and, that's that's what we got to embody moving forward the best that we possibly can. There'd be two ways we could go. One would be to shut down, which I've done a little bit of, and that doesn't work. And the other one is the manta ray, you know? Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, and make that choice. And whatever comes with it is, is part of the process and the icing on the cake. Yeah. Wow. Uh, um what other messages have you got from animals underwater? Oh, gosh. <laughs> so many. I'm glad that you're asking me. Uh, the, just recently, I, we, I went to Malpelo, which is a place yeah. that Rob and I had never been able to go before. It's off Colombia. And if you're familiar with Colombia, you probably have heard Malpelo before. I went to it's a, Gorgona, but I never went to Malpelo. Malpelo yeah. is ridiculous. Cocos Island in Costa Rica was always my favorite spot on the planet for the last 10 or more years and one of Rob's favorite places as well. But we particularly scripted Malpelo into this film because we both wanted to go there so damn bad and we never had a chance to do so. So I made sure, you know, even after he passed, that I would get out to Malpelo and I'd take him with me and I took a bunch of his ashes with and we dedicated a, a spot uh, off the shore of Malpelo to Robbie and it's going to be a sanctuary for sharks and in his honor so it's a beautiful thing but whilst we were out there um, we took the shark water boat out there there's a boat named in his honor as well that's aimed at oceanic conservation and I was out on the shark water vessel and we were doing uh, a bunch of filming and diving out there and, and the place is very well known as a congregation site for hammerheads but also for silky sharks yeah. and it's the only place in the world that Silky sharks congregate in this kind of number. And man, we were underwater and this bait ball showed up. And all of a sudden, in the surrounding water, I was about 30 feet under. So it was in beautiful blue water with bright light. And there was thousands of silky sharks just swimming in circles around me. And wow. I just... I looked around and I, I literally maybe crapped my wetsuit and then <laughs> just started to be like, does this still exist on this planet or is, is this really happening? And I just heard, you know, Rob's chuckle, that little giggle <laughs> right in the back of my mind. I just start to hear him laughing, you know, and all of a sudden everything's just changing. And there's a shot of it in the film where there's sharks just converging in all directions and it's beautiful. It's like a symphony. Yeah. And it's just glorious. And it's shot in the most beautiful light. And I got this incredible, like, six-minute long shot wow. of just thousands of sharks swimming with each other. And it's almost like choreographed. 
it's the most beautiful shot I've seen in a long time. And oh, that, that was just another magical thing that he directed and placed in front of the camera for us. It was awesome. Really, really awesome. Oh, I can't wait to watch the film. I can't wait till you see it either. I hope yeah. you love it. Yeah. Maybe you can come to Toronto for the uh, the premiere. It's on September the 7th. September 7th? Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. Love to have you there. It would yeah. be fantastic. It's at TIFF. And, uh, it's it's going to get, you know... A lot of great accolades as that's his hometown and, and Toronto is very supportive of all Rob's work and I think it'll be a, a hell of a party to be honest with you. Oh, I'd love to come. Um, I'm going to be, I think I was going to, I was going to fly to New York, I think September 3rd or 5th from Miami, but I think I might just fly to Toronto and then go to New York or something like that. <laughs> That's easy, yeah. yeah. New York is just like you know an hour and a half flight or something from Toronto, so yeah. there you go. A little Same. side detour. Yeah, for sure. Count me in. Yeah, it'd yeah. be beautiful also to like to sort of you know feel Robbie's presence through everyone, you know, through the film. Yes, and that will it will be a huge. Him. It'll be a huge gathering of the tribe. I think everyone's coming, so yeah. I, I think you've got to make it if you can. It'd be oh, great. Sweet. Yeah. I mean, you'll tell me what I need to do, where I get a ticket or whatever it is. and I'll Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Sweet. We'll get a chance to connect in person rather than on the Skype thing. Yeah, sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, totally. There's been some other great things underwater, too. Several times manta rays have become like a token spirit animal and, and a chance for us to communicate and talk underwater. They have been showing up in incredible spots. I also just went back to Cocos Island um, off of Costa Rica, which you're probably familiar with. It's it's another great congregation area for sharks. And, no, I've um, actually never been to Cocos Island. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. I highly recommend, if you have the means, I highly recommend heading yeah. out. It's, it's, it's a beautiful spot, but the ecosystem there is changing drastically right now. Um, water temperatures are on the rise as they are all over the globe. Yeah. So that's changing. It's been a hammerhead aggregation site, and um, scalloped hammerheads show up there in mass. The numbers have dwindled some, probably due to fishing pressures and and other things, but also due to warmer water. And uh, tiger sharks have shown up there in the last like seven years or so, and they're starting to show up like in pretty good numbers. The turtles have all disappeared. Um, either oh, being sad. eaten by the tiger sharks or being run away by the tigers. And uh, it's really interesting to watch this kind of like cascade effect of the ecosystem changing and, and what happens in the food chain and who sticks around and who disappears. And, yeah, yeah. you know, like all the players are, are changing right now. So this trip was very interesting to go out there and watch the tigers start to take over the island and see what happens. And uh, there was a particular tiger out there that, they, they've been, how shall we say this, like getting a little territorial and uh, protecting their feeding grounds. I think they're starving to death, to be honest with you, to wow. They're like hungry, so they're just showing up wherever they can find food source. So these tigers are showing up out there, and they've been known to get a little bit aggressive with divers. And uh, there was one y little young male that <laughs> was cruising around this uh, this kind of spire that sticks up out there called Menwalita and and this tiger's cruising around patrolling making sure that everybody knows that this is his area and then I just started talking to him and I was like hey what's up how you doing I'm mm -hmm. not here to eat any of your food don't worry about that <laughs> you know like yeah can we chill can we be cool and all of a sudden his demeanor changed drastically his pectoral friends went right back out to the side he stopped doing circles around us and started to cruise and glide a little oh, bit more. Good. And then all of a sudden it became curiosity rather than like, get the fuck out of my water kind of thing. You yeah, know? yeah. And then uh, oh, he patrolled awesome. that area for quite some time. And we named that, that area Tiger Pass. And right underneath it is a place we called Robbie's Reef. Oh. And uh, it, it turned out to be awesome. So we're getting that named in Rob's honor. And uh, as I mentioned, I had several vials of his ashes that I deployed in some of his favorite places around the world that he had been to and places that he really desperately wanted to go to. And oh. I took one vial out to Cocos, and for the first time I did an underwater ceremony there, and we put the ashes on Robbie's reef and deployed them whilst on scuba. So that was... Oh, that's beautiful. 
it was insane. It was just insane, man. Like it was, yeah. it was super emotional and yet super freeing. And, uh, you know, Costa Rica is a place where we had spent a lot of our time together. So it was like the circle was completed kind of thing. And it was yeah. the, the final vial of his ashes. I had taken eight vials all around to different places in the world. And this oh, one, beautiful. it was like a homecoming of sorts, a place yeah. that he loved so much. Um, it was epic. Oh. <laughs> a grand tale for sure. Yeah. Oh, man. Just be so happy. Just yeah. Just like, you know, feeling how, how everybody around him and, and you and his family and everyone else is just so present, so there for him, you know? Beautiful. Uh, and the inverse is also true. I mean, yeah. I, I would say even more so. He's been so present in his communications with everybody, you know, like in, in showing up when the people that he loved need, need him. Yeah. So it's just crazy. I mean, you know, typically a spirit can stick around in this plane for a short period of time after they pass and then they have to move on and do their thing. He's been present this whole time, you know, he's been busy this whole time. <laughs> he's just, he's, he's got something special that dude. Yeah. And, uh, you yeah, know, he, sure. he learned how to, to manifest whilst on this planet and he learned how to communicate with energy while here and he took that with him and you know there's certain of us that had learned to speak that energy with him and we keep receiving all these messages bro and it's it's wild and uh you know every time that i go through some of the things that that come out now in, in this life people that don't even believe in this kind of stuff are just struck by it and they're they're yeah. like, holy shit, I, I kind of believe that. That's weird, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, it's just true. Oh, you may think it's strange or unusual, but these are the things that are happening, you know? So. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Even all our, you know, hardcore science friends, I tell them some of the stories about, you know, like the conversation I had with him when, when we found him and how it was instantaneous. And they're just like, there's no logical explanation for that. Well, no. <laughs> like, you're exactly right. <laughs> yeah. It ain't a logical explanation. This is a spiritual thing, dude. Yeah. You know, there's more than just us around here. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, even I think all those, um, hardcore scientists haven't read enough quantum physics because then they would be like oh yeah we don't know anything <laughs> that's exactly right you don't understand it's, anything of what's going on you know it's really funny that you say that because there was a speech at his funeral at robbie's funeral that said you want a physicist to speak at your funeral to explain to the people that you love that you're not gone you're just <laughs> less orderly <laughs> you know <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's just less just orderly. Turned into I, chaos. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I always liked that. You know, I, I even cracked me up through my tears as I was bawling at his funeral. I was just oh. like, "That's perfectly him," you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because as we well know, matter is never created nor destroyed. It just changes shape. Totally. Mm -hmm. You know, so <laughs> I thought that that was a beautiful thing. You want a physicist to speak at your funeral. <laughs> Or a Buddhist. Yeah, yeah. I love that quote by uh, Thich Nhat Hanh that says, you were once a mountain, you were once a cloud. This is not poetry, this is biology. <laughs> 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 I love him so much because he explains everything. So, first of all, so open and, and compassionate and so gentle. And at the same time, from an evolutionary perspective, and he uses biology and chemistry to explain buddhist concepts and so people are it. like completely design you know just like oh okay yes. yeah they can't argue yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man i have to read some of that you'll have to send me some of his stuff oh i will i will there's this amazing book called the heart sutra uh, no it's not the heart sutra his book is called the other shore and it's mm -hmm. his interpretation of the heart sutra which is the biggest buddhist um text Cool. But he explains just this, what we're talking about, what Robbie talked about. He explains transformation and he explains emptiness and impermanence mm -hmm. um, in, in ways that are just, you're like, okay, I get it. <laughs> no matter what you believe in or don't, or, or don't believe in. 
Right. Um, he, he does it so well, so, so well. Very interesting. Yeah. That'd be uh, timely, actually, yeah. at this juncture of everything that, you know, I've seen and, and unseen in this short year and a half, or which also seems like a full lifetime. Yeah. It'd be really, really good. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been going through some major, like, soul-searching and, and quite a depression of sorts and, and pulling out of this towards the light. This would be actually a brilliant time for yeah. me to check in on some of that. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, I've been on the same boat, I think, you know, especially until until a couple of weeks ago. It was just like a very, very inward, a very solitary inward journey while at the same time developing a bunch of amazing things like the whole, this whole project the podcast and and the lifestyle brand around it and these ideas for education and with an amazing group of people a great composer and an amazing illustrator and and just it's been awesome while at the same time just being completely sort of like looking at at the at the flaws at the weaknesses as at all the all my shadow sides uh you know um and absolute uncertainty of where I am at this moment. You know, my friends ask me, so where are you living? And I'm like, um, I'm on the road. I live on the planet right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I haven't really been living on the planet for the last little while. I've been somewhere else altogether. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I feel like I'm getting more, more grounded these days, though. I, actually have just spent some time at home for the first time in a long while everything has been offshore on boats while finishing the film you know and a lot of travel and yeah. and you know so i just have been home for almost a month right now which is the longest stint in quite some time it feels good that sounds good yeah yeah uh, um yeah, I don't know, but there's something beautiful about being being in the present and being absolutely in the present. It's just like I'm not looking, like, I, in terms of where I'm living right now, I don't know where, where it is I'm going to settle again or if I am going to, you know, plant myself somewhere at all. <laughs> right. Um, while at the same time being super present, developing, you know, all the projects and... Um, but while being on the road and navigating sort of like one day at a time, it's beautiful. Very interesting. Yeah. It's, just, it's, it's a gorgeous process. It's kind of like the, the, I mean, I'm sure when you're traveling and you're, I mean, I know that production can be a little faster and a little more intense and stressful, but when you're not in the city, time seems to just slow down and you, when you're unplugged and you like the days seem to last longer and you're like, Oh, do I get more life <laughs> like this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The it's moments a, become lingering and sweeter. Yeah. You're right. When it's production, it's not that way at all. Everything goes super fast yeah, all the totally. time. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I remember the days of travel and when, when Robbie was around and we were working on film stuff, it was a little different. You know, he had a, a great way of slowing things down and not pushing too hard and I miss that, you know, because we've we've had to really try to get things done. So it's been a little bit more hectic when we were working together. It was on its own kind of timeline and it would just it would be the way that it would be. And we'd find those sweetness moments like stop at a little market in the middle of, you know, a third world country somewhere and buy a box of mangoes and sit on the curb and just eat them yeah. <laughs> all eat every mango that the store had and can just laugh yeah. for like an hour straight and be so, yeah. yeah just sticky and like you know with the big smile and like all those little veiny pieces of mango stuck in our teeth and those are the moments you remember you know yeah totally. they're great oh, man. strangely enough it just seems that the day robbie died he was pushing things right yeah. Um, going a little, well, a little deeper, one more time. You know. 
Yeah, yes, yes. Um, it was a it was a real tragedy in, in that, you know, like there was a lot of elements in play. And of course, this was a dive that we had trained to do for quite some time, but we were new to the equipment, you know, relatively new in the, in the vast consideration of things. Yeah. And, you know, um, cause you were spending, using rebreathers, right? We were, yeah, yeah, we were using rebreathers. We've both been scuba diving for a really long time, but rebreathers were new to us. So we've been training for yeah. about a year on the equipment. You know, there's a little less than that, about nine months or so, but uh, you know, that's, that's new in the grand scheme of things, especially to be taking these kind of challenges. But we were very interested in finding sawfish and this was one of our best chances to look for them. So we were, we were going for it yeah. and you know, I, I agree with you. It was a little bit pushed on that final day and it's just, it's an unfortunate circumstance. I, I was there so much wish that there was a different outcome on that, but I, as we talked about before, yeah, I guess everything happens as it's meant to, I, I can't find any other reasoning behind it. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. And, uh, I'm a big proponent of the idea that, you know, our, obstacles are our great opportunities and that this isn't happening to us it's happening for us and perhaps there's no discernible reason for it at this moment but it is for a reason and there there will be something beautiful and good that comes from it yeah but it's a it's a fucker of a process I'll tell yeah you. <laughs> yeah but what have you been doing to to you know help yourself and support yourself through this very stressful sort of you know and the moments of depression and real you know i don't know do you do you hang on to something or do you think of him or do you still talk to him i do i still talk to him every yeah. day really yeah and uh <laughs> He's kind of a tough love <laughs> son of a gun, you know. He's like, quit your crying. You get to go swim with sharks. This is supposed yeah. to be fun, isn't it? You know, like he always, he was always that guy. Yeah. Really, you know, he always says it with a grin and kind of gives me a little kick in the balls, but yeah. <laughs> it's with love. And you know, he was he was like my little brother. We spent so much time together over the course of the last, I guess, about twelve years or so. And yeah. You know, like just, we just had this way of being a little bit competitive with each other and, and giving each other a little bit of a hard time, but it was always just in such love that, you know, right now he, I can hear him just laughing at me, just like, <laughs> I, I've heard him say so many times, quit your fucking crying, get out there and do this, you know? <laughs> so I definitely oh, yeah. speak to him and hold on to that, like, sense of play that he always had and. Uh, you know, I make sure that I remember all those good times, like the light in his eyes and that humongous smile that he had. It's just, yeah. it's contagious. You remember it. It's just like <laughs> that grin when yeah. he's on the dance floor across from you. And all of a sudden you see like Robbie dancing off the beat in some weird yeah. way, <laughs> you know, but just with a smile from yeah. the corner of each eye, yeah. you know, just hanging on his face. <laughs> you know, you just can't help but such fun times, you know. It's it's yeah. Um, I just feel that yeah. yeah, such fun times. And he was really he was the best at that that I know of. We dealt with a lot of heavy shit, you know, like being in places where they didn't want us to be around and seeing massive carnage to shark populations, which to him and I was like our family, you know, like yeah. seeing thousands and thousands of carcasses all piled up on the cement floor of a port. And he'd have a way of like somehow shedding some light on it, being positive about it, recognizing, like I talked about before, that this challenge was an opportunity for us to get better, for us to step up and figure out a way to communicate this tragedy to the world and help the world to, be, to evolve into their more full potential. You know, yeah. it was, he, he was brilliant with that. He was the best that I ever known about 
remembering to enjoy life and to have fun. And, and like you say, and in travel, slow down and have those moments that linger yeah. that you hold on to and you remember that you almost watch like shot on a beautiful camera in, in gorgeous light, you know? It's just, it's, yeah, he was really good at it. That's true. That's true. It's, it's he's something, really good at it. it. It's something I struggle with a lot. And I know a lot of people who also have the, you know, the protector or warrior or hero gene, you know, or configuration, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Um, yes. We're always struggling between, oh, I want to help change the world. And at the same time, I also want to enjoy the world and being alive. And how do I do it again? Yeah. And and you go through some periods where you're absolutely consumed with just your mission and you forget to enjoy that. And he was always just I remember we we, you know, doing all these cool projects, but at the same time there was all these dancing. <laughs> yeah, always dancing. That's exactly right. You know, all like, this awesome he, dancing and cooking and just celebrating life. It's beautiful. For sure. He was able to find that balance and he was one of the rare ones that ever was. And he wasn't always that way. It it took him a lot of practice to, oh, to find sure. that, yeah. you know, like throughout the course of life. For a long time he was steadfast on the mission. It was all work and you know, yeah. it burnt him a bit and he figured out a way to like, oh like, this is not sustainable. And yeah. I was always that way and I was pushing him, let's work harder, let's keep going, you know, and he was like Nope. No. Nope. We're having a rest day. You know, we're going to chill and uh, I'm yeah. going to listen to some music and paint my toenails and we're going to go swimming. <laughs> I'd be like, what? We got shit to do. Come on, let's go. He'd be like, nope. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Okay. That is so fun. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, he's, he's brilliant with that. And it's, I think, maybe one of the most important lessons that I. Have learned from him. It's just that you know he he want you to stop and dance, and smell some good stuff, and you know smile. Yeah, hang a grin from eyeball to eyeball, just in his fashion. Yeah, stop and dance. <laughs> yeah, stop, stop, drop and dance. I like that <laughs> idea. You should do some t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh man, so um. On a quick technical note and ed educational note, um, yes. can you explain people what a rebreather is? I'm just going to change subjects <laughs> like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, take me in whatever direction you need to go to get information for the podcast. So for the rebreather, um, it's a very interesting kind of technological development in underwater scuba diving. It's a closed circuit unit, which means that you recycle your exhale and it goes through uh, a process and a, a system to scrub the carbon dioxide out of it and then you add a little bit of oxygen to it and you rebreathe it into your loop so that you're not exhaling bubbles and gases into the water. You're recycling and regenerating that, that exhale into your following inhale. Yeah. So the reason that these are you know, interesting and, and um, valuable to people like Rob and myself is, you know, underwater animals are scared about bubbles. Yeah, Think yeah. about like going on safari in Africa into like a, a pride of lions with a leaf blower on your back, you know, the animals are just going to scatter. They're just, <laughs> what the hell are you doing here? You yeah. know, it's, it's almost a similar thing with yeah, an open totally. circuit scuba rig underwater. Yeah. You're swimming and all of a sudden you've got this big yeah. exhale coming out, yeah. you know, and it disturbs everything. Yeah. So we took to free diving quite a bit because it's a very beautiful and pure form to get underwater and, you know, not have disturbances in the water column. Yeah, but, but a couple of minutes, course, I guess, don't do it. Yeah, there's there's limitations to it. Yeah. And we trained a lot with free diving, and at, at a certain point, our breath holds were getting really good. Um, mine is diminished since the accident because that goes along with confidence and everything else that goes yeah, along with it. Sure. But I'm training to get it back up, and you know, I, I think I'll be free diving for a really long, long time. And Rob really loved free diving, and he was very good at it and very talented at it and we towards um the the initiation of this film we were starting to get trained by some professionals we had always just kind of done it on our own 
but we actually took some courses and started to learn some techniques and stuff and and the breath holds were increasing dramatically and it was pretty cool so so we were very excited about free diving but as you mentioned you know you get a few minutes three five minutes and all of a sudden you're you're limited and so rebreathers were very intriguing to us and that we could go down and stay down for literally hours without creating this disturbance in the water without having bubbles and you know all kinds of noise and and junk that goes along with it so we were training to use these rebreathers in the film and uh our we did one shoot with them off California, but our first big shoot was the one in the Keys, yeah. which ultimately ended in tragedy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We were, unfortunately, we were looking forward to using them quite a bit. And I don't know if I'll ever dive on a rebreather again or not. Everyone has asked me that question over and over again. You, you're going to use that thing, you know, that status is not good you know there's a lot of people that have died on these units and my answer is i'm not sure like i I don't know if i'll ever dive on that again or if i won't but i will tell you that i really did enjoy the process while we were doing it as did rob yeah for sure we felt like we had superhero powers you know like all of a sudden you can dive to greater depth stealth diving totally (laughs) total stealth diving you know like that and we and To me, it it felt different than diving on compressed gas in that it didn't really take as big of a toll on your nervous system and on your physical body. It sounds to me like you're a diver, so you probably know, like, when you dive, and especially on air, it, it, like, tires you out, and you feel feel the effects of it, you know, if you're spending a lot of time at depth. Nitrox is a little better, obviously, and different gas mixtures are a little bit better than just regular air, but depending upon what depths you're working at. But the rebreather was it was very interesting because you can also manipulate the concentration of and the the mixtures of your gases to be ideal for the depths that you're diving at. So you're always breathing the the best mix possible for yourself. That sounds, so there, that sounds amazing and very sophisticated. So it is. Like, you know. Yeah. It, yeah, it's it's not it's not like a cakewalk to learn how to do it. It's very technical, and mm-hmm. you know, um, there's been a lot of hearsay about like you know, well, these guys were using gear that they didn't even know anything about. And whilst it's true, we are new to this kind of technology in the grand scheme of things. We, yeah. we were we were trained on it, and we spent yeah. close to a year working to get towards this level. Um, so it's not like we just all of a sudden <laughs> bought one and dove in and decided to go to 250 feet and see what happens, you know? Yeah, of course. I, yeah. I don't want people to have the wrong idea in that direction, but yeah, yeah th- this is sophisticated diving. They're sophisticated pieces of equipment and there is high margin for error and accident. So yeah. it's, you know, it's nothing to take lightly by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. So in a way, it's the it's not like because the the gas mixture process is so sophisticated. It was more a thing of maybe just going too deep too many times or something like that. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. the Coast Guard and the Navy has done a bunch of different reports as to what they consider to have gone wrong. And they still haven't released those port reports yet. And this is yeah. a year and a half later. Wow. So. They're really taking their time and really digging through all the evidence and, and all that kind of stuff. So, Well, like you said you know, earlier, it was probably just, yeah, scripted in a very strange, mysterious way, you know. Um, it's a big part of it, bro. I mean, I, I believe in that. And, yeah. Oh. You know, it, it's interesting because on this trip, we both knew that there was potential and, and felt that there was potential for something to go wrong. And, you know, the trip had been canceled previously and there was a lot of different like roadblocks that came up and we kept being like, okay, well, what does that mean? How do we do this? What do we do? Let's keep going. Let's figure it out. And, you know, looking back in hindsight, a lot of it was telling us, you know, don't do this. And we both knew that, but at the same time, this is what we do and this is what we trained for, you know, and like, 
even though, though there's risk, does that mean that we don't go? And we both knew that, but I never thought it was going to be Robbie. You know, like I, yeah. to be honest with you, I thought it was probably going to be me that didn't come back from that. But uh, that uh, I didn't know what to do in that particular thing. This is like one of the oldest debates of like this is dharma and purpose and this is what's set before me and even though it's challenging and there's things that tell you to turn back does that mean you quit on your mission that's not how we go about things that's not how he would go about it nor i would go about it we would just try to get over the obstacles in the best way that we possibly could to continue forward on the mission and this is part of the mission that we thought was very important yeah unfortunately it just um, turned out with the hmm. a result that I wish was really wish was different. You know, yeah. like, uh, I would give anything to have him back. Oh, mm-hmm. I would give anything to have him back. Oh man! But I I do know and I do believe that he knows that there was a greater purpose and a greater calling in in this and yeah. Yeah, Somehow, sure. some way, we'll, we'll figure it out. We have to. We have to figure it out. <laughs> and right now, I hear him saying to me again, "Quit your fucking crying. <laughs> get get back on track. You know? like, and don't forget to have fun and dance while you're at it." Oh. Yeah. Oh. Well, yeah. His legacy is that shark water extinction gets to come out and thanks to you guys and and we get to share with with people around the world more and more knowledge about how we're connected to nature and how we need to protect all of life and why it matters to protect sharks and why it matters to change a lot of things in the way we run our lives yes yes absolutely you know that old quote my life is my message well it rings true for rob as well you know it really does and it's just like his message and his life very well lived is providing a shining example on how to do this and and you're right to notice the importance of sharks and what they mean not just you know to the oceans and to that particular ecosystem but what that ecosystem means to all of us on this planet it's so very crucial that we start to take note and protect it because without the sharks on this planet nothing else will exist and i believe the planet will probably survive over time and it'll take a long time to rebuild itself but it's you know if it goes out of balance in such a grand way that these architects that have built life on this planet for 450 million years and controlled the entire balance of things in the oceans which controls the balance of things on land you know if we if we thrust this out of balance in a way that is unrecoverable the planet will take a massive hit it'll shake us all off like fleas and then it'll start over and who knows what life will look like yeah you know there's, after that process there's such an there's such an important mirror for for every single human i think to to look at traffic cascades and to look at predators and and see they're like a role model of you know how to take care of ecosystems and and um, absolutely and we are yeah i'm so glad you said that word trophic cascades i love that word yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's so cool it's um we're at the top right and and we need to start you know Finding balance ourselves. Yeah, and right? understanding the responsibility that being a top predator, you know, means the, the the responsibility that comes with being on top of the food chain and actually, you know, properly manage. You can just make everything thrive so much more, and all of life is just just self organizes and just blooms into richness and and beauty and diversity it's really interesting what you just said i've never really thought of it in that way in that you know 
we are the apex predator on land, basically, and sharks are the apex predator in the ocean. And, and the imbalance of how, you know, their population is dwindling so drastically and ours is rising so drastically. Yeah. It's a really interesting thought process to use that as a mirror and yeah. as an, a law of inverses in sorts. But now that you're mentioning that, like looking at it on an equilibrium kind of scale and to use our own kind of thought process on this planet and compare it to how sharks work in the trophic cascades, we have to apply that same principle to us on land. Yeah. I've never thought of it that way, but I really like that. That's awesome. Very cool. I'm glad you see it. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, yeah. I've been working on a story to you know show the role of sharks in the ecosystem on a reef kind of like you may have seen that video of like wolves in yellowstone how they've even changed the course of rivers yeah it's a beautiful video yeah it is it's gorgeous and it was so profound and like just the reintroduction of the predator into this ecosystem what happened to everything else you know yeah and i've been working on trying to show that in the water it's gorgeous and um we have a really cool story that we'll put out at some point that kind of portrays this story and and the shark as the apex predator and how ecosystems thrive when things are in balance oh but that sounds amazing it's great man it's a be- beautiful beautiful shop and now you've just given me an idea of how we show that with people you know like yeah and correlate the two absolutely. and take it even one step further it's it's awesome i really if that's what comes out of this conversation today i'm fucking stoked yeah that's a it's a good move yeah, like, that would be awesome. Actually, yeah, it would well, be awesome to do a story on each of the top predators. You know, like the wolf video is already there, but you know, you do the sharks and you could do the jaguars and the lions and so on and so forth for every single um, ecosystem on the planet. Absolutely, um, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the but the way idea. I see it right now is like it's a it's a delineation between the water and the land. And I never, I mean, I've thought of us as the apex predator on land, of course, because it's true. Yeah. But I didn't really think of how it affects the entire food chain and and you know the definition of the trophic cascade. So yeah, thinking about that and and what that means with us as the apex predator so far on balance and population and how that's impacting the world and all the species that you know, cascade down from that. Yeah. It's a, it's a totally different thought process for me. So yeah. thank you. Thank Sweet. you very much. I'm so glad I could contribute a little idea. Yeah, um, me too. That's a well, great one. You know, that's the whole idea with this podcast is like, I'm, I'm, I'm there thinking of these and, uh, and, and I don't know if you saw, but we created this 13 characters, which are like half animal, half human. And oh, I haven't all, seen that they yet. All, they all have their ecosystems around them. And it was inspired in a way in in your work and Robbie's work, in that Yellowstone wolf video. And my understanding of because I'm a chef of of food um, and food webs and and my research into regenerative agriculture and how we manage the land. And it just made me think how much do we really need to to understand our place on the food chain and understand our, our relationship to the environment from a circular understanding, you know, like we need to start relating to the world around us f- from a circular place, you know, not this linear old sort of system where we, we just take say a piece of land and, and we use it, you know, or oh, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to open a raspberry farm and I just opened my raspberry farm. And now we're, we're seeing all these people growing food that are like, oh, you know what? I'm going to manage this beautiful ecosystem where there are, there happen to be raspberries. But I'm, I'm actually managing a circular place that has many different variables like the soil, the bugs in the soil, and the birds, and the water, and the, you know, it's more complex than just, just, just the one thing. More, you know, so we can move into like, thinking in terms of systems in terms of, yeah. And, yeah absolutely and that's, these that's beautiful just illustrate that very well yeah wow. i mean this time period is calling yeah. the best in all of us and we well know that 
as humans, we have the ingenuity to overcome the challenges that are facing us. Oh, it's sorry. just, you know, it's just a question of whether or not we will step up and, and do that or we'll continue to rely on the convenience and, you know, the easy way of doing things. But if we do happen to step up into the solutions that will change the way things are done on this planet, that will be the next great evolution. Rob talked about that a lot yeah. in his life of like, you know, these challenges are our opportunity to step up and be who we actually can and, and are meant to be. Yeah. So what you're talking about there is a beautiful example of that. We, we know how to do things better than just on this linear, small box kind of way. We just yeah. have to implement them and change the way that things are done on a grander scale. Oh, it's beautiful. I believe well, it's it happening. Is. It's happening. It's happening. With, uh, yeah. It's happening around the world. I feel like last year just many of us just got the i mean we probably heard the calling from from a while back but the end of last year was just like okay this is happening now and you guys are activating you know? yeah <laughs> and, and it has the to happen step. now yeah <laughs> right yeah. like it's like imperative at this point it just yeah. it has to happen and there's totally. there's no stopping it and mm -hmm. we just need to become instruments and tools to make that next great revolution and evolution come to fruition yes yeah. it's, it's, it's got to go and and you know i'm really excited that um i mean i i'll ask you about that in five minutes about about um shark water extinction but um to quote again or not to quote but to talk again about buddhism and Thich Nhat Han, um he he's all about showing people how you're not separated how you how to come out of the illusion that you're separated from nature which is what happens to most of us in cities because it's hard to be in a city and feel like you're part of a living system. <laughs> yes. There's concrete all around and you don't see the stars and so on. Right. So, yeah. And you live looking at your cell phone, you know, like, yeah. and that's your connection to the rest of the world is through this little box in your hand. Yeah. You know, yeah. that, that definitely is a disconnect from yeah. nature and the natural world. Yeah. But once you come it's out something of that, that we have illusion, to, Yes. Yeah. Of being separated and you understand, you know, sort of like the nature of our, of our being here, then, I mean, there's a bunch of things we don't know about energy and particles and all that, but we do understand how, you know, if, if we get educated and the, the, the knowledge is there, we just need to spread it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right. I think that there's a tremendous upwelling of understanding of that energy yeah. and it, it, it's coming at the right time i just hope that <laughs> it, it continues to accelerate in such a way that we can get there before it's too late yeah yeah i mean what i uh, there's so many so many clear changes i mean this year has been the the hottest in history around the world um yeah i was in the colombian caribbean and the island I remember from, I hadn't been there for like 25 years. This short, tiny little island that was like paradise. I remember you would get in the water and you had to like ask the fish to just move away because there were so many of them. It was so crowded with fish and with, you know, uh, rays and just, it was beautiful, the coral reefs and, and all that. And now the, the beaches were gone. Mm. and there were there was hardly any coral and then there were just like a handful of fish around you right like, wow that's sad that's just very depressing you know that's in our lifetime yeah, yeah. isn't that wild like 25, 25 years, years. It's, yeah yeah it's just it's so gnarly it's so gnarly yeah and we gotta we gotta halt that kind of uh downhill slide and hopefully move it back uphill towards what was once beautiful and yeah you got to try to reinvigorate yeah. nature and, and the wilderness and everything that goes along with it probably had a thing that he was wanting to do called wildify and rewildify the, the planet i remember yeah was, uh, i remember that to, <laughs> yeah you remember talking to him about that yeah about it's, wildify, it's cool yeah it's just like yeah, yeah it's like, like exactly what we're talking about living in harmony with nature rather than trying to you know conquer or destroy or manipulate it yeah absolutely 
and that's that's where we got to go. I mean, these are precious resources that are worth a whole lot more than dollars in the bank. Yeah. So for people listening, I I want to go a little into Shark Water because Shark Water came out in two thousand seven, and when I saw that film, I was like, oh my god, these guys actually went for the. <laughs> I remember those scenes where, you know, Robbie goes with Paul Watson against the pirates and the whole thing. It's just like, oh my God, it was such an important yeah. documentary on sharks and exposing shark fin illegal trade and, and it inspired so much. It really did, yeah. What is shark water some... extinction? Um, what, what story is it telling us? What can we expect? What, what are we looking at? Well, it's a, a reinvestigation of the similar problem. Okay. As you mentioned, Sharkwater was groundbreaking in that it, you know, changed government policy in like 22 countries and 150 million people now live in a place where shark fin is an illegal substance. So it had a massive impact on the world wow. and it changed a lot of people's lives, including That's mine, amazing. including yours. Yeah. yeah, it was it was drastic what it could do as far as a film goes and you witness this whippersnapper young charismatic dude that said wasn't going to take no for an answer and he was going to go out and save sharks and you know put his life on the line again and again in order to tell the truth of the story of that was happening and at that point it was largely about shark fins and shark fin soup because you know the fins were being hacked off of sharks alive and the carcass was thrown basically back into the water because it would take up too much uh, real estate in the hold of the ship. So they just wanted to keep the parts that were worth the money. So God. they'd throw the rest of the shark back and it would die a horrible and gruesome death because it couldn't swim. And sharks, for the most part, need to be able to swim to breathe to get yeah. water moving through their oh gills. So they would suffocate and die. And often it would take you know, <clears throat> a long time. It's, it's like akin to slicing the, the mouth and the legs off of a dog or something and say, go fend for yourself. You know, they can't do nothing. Yeah. So it was terrible. It was, it was a brutal and tragic kind of practice. So shark water really kind of changed that. It brought shark finning to light. And, um, you know, it, it changed a lot of how things were done. Uh, the demand for shark fin soup has gone down like by 70% in Hong Kong, they say. You know, so there's been progress made. But unfortunately, the number of sharks being fished out of our waters has increased even with all this awareness and with everything that has happened over the last decade it's still still not helping the population of sharks in fact it's now kind of uh estimated that between 100 and 150 million sharks are being fished out of our waters when shark water came out it was at 80 million so it's gone up by at wow, least 20 million insane. maybe even doubled Right. Why? And what what's do they use now them is, for? I mean, beyond besides, you know, the Chinese shark fin culture of, you know, this delicacy thing. Well, now that, uh, that that's what's up now. There there's new markets that have been developed for all different kind of shark, shark parts. So they, they've been forced to land the shark with the fins attached in a lot, a lot of these places. Finning still happens in a lot of other places. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But now in a lot of spots. You have to land the, the shark with the fin attached. So they've made new markets for shark product. And it, the, the liver oil is being used in like cosmetics and it's labeled as squalene. And it's this stuff that's being used in lipstick and moisturizer. And shark parts are being used in fertilizer products. So you're spreading shark all over your garden to grow some vegetables unwillingly, you know, uh, or it's being used in pet foods, you know, like uh, kitty cats are eating shark. Tell me that's not a food chain that's out of whack. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> that's insane. It, it's insane, man. Apex predator is being fed to Yeah, the guys the house who cat. are needed to control the whole ocean ecosystem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. And of course, you know, human consumption as well. It's being mislabeled for human consumption. It's being served as fish and chips in London, you know? It's being served as, as like different things called rock salmon and flake and Boyo and Casson and all kinds of different things. So yeah. people are eating shark, which, to be quite honest with you, is a terrible move, not just for the health of the sharks, but for the health of the human beings. Because as an apex predator, as you can guess, 
mercury levels and PCBs yeah. and pollutant contaminants like go exponentially up the food chain. Yeah. So they start to mass in, in the high level predators and sharks are at the top of that. So if you're eating shark, you're eating an exponential <laughs> like cesspool of contaminant. Yeah. So oh, that's insane. That's not only bad for the environment yeah. and the ecosystem. It's terrible for human beings. It's linked to all kinds of neurotoxins and brain damages and in children in Florida. It's been linked to all kinds of different cancers. It's it's a bad news situation on all accounts. Yeah. So shark water extinction goes into, of course, the extinction of the species, but also what it means for everything else and how shark has migrated into all these products that we have no idea about and that are being fed to people, to animals, to plants even, that, that it's making its way into our food chain and we are being lied to about it. So this documentary is calling for an uprising in yeah. that we need to be more aware of what's happening, not only you know to the sharks, but in respect as a result of what's happening to the sharks, what's happening to us and to our little loved ones, the pets and, and everything else along the way. So that's kind of a nutshell of what's going on in shark water, but it's as, as it would with, you know, with Robbie and his positive message, it's, it spins it in a way that gives us solutions and actions to work on. Yeah. That we can become part of the process and part of the movement to end this rather than just being a doomsday kind of like gloom and doom message that says this is fucking awful and it's happening. You know, yeah, yeah. this, this is Rob. So totally. he's saying this is awful and it's happening, but this is what we can do. You know, we can stop this and we can become part of the movement to change things in the world. Yeah. And as always, our greatest challenges become our greatest catalysts. So it's calling that, that greatness that we were speaking about. It's calling all of us to stand up and find ways to be the person that changes the world, you know? And he was a shining example, a, a beacon in a lighthouse of that. And now he's asking us all to pick up that torch in his honor and march forward with, with this mission that he's left behind for us. Yeah. So, well, beautiful. So that's, that's the whole idea. We'll do, I man. mean, you, we're, yeah. we're at a moment where we actually can you know, figure out what the solutions are. It's just, you know. Yeah. I love that yeah, quote by uh, and, Mr. Fuller used to say that you don't change the existing reality by fighting it. You just create new models of reality, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's why. He's 100% you know, correct. Yeah. I mean, we can, we can reimagine I mean, our, our, our reality and we can rebuild it. You know, we get to do that with we, our, And we must. Our, yeah. And we must. Yeah. yeah, and we must because you're right. If you fight it, all you do is create a fight. Yeah, <laughs> somebody's gonna dig their heels in and fight back just as hard as they possibly can. Totally. So you're right. We have to change the reality, and yeah. we have to create a new one that's beautiful. Yeah, you know that people want to be a part of. That's motivating rather than just confrontational. Absolutely. Oh, I'm so looking forward. So looking forward to it. Thanks, to man. Come yeah. to Toronto. Thanks for all the like, you know, thanks for showing up and, and putting in all the hours and the energy while going through mourning Robbie's death. And yeah, oh, man. Well, I wouldn't have it any other way. I yeah. made him a promise. You know, we for talked sure. about that promise and I promised him that I would stay steadfast on the mission Beautiful. and uh, Beautiful. I, I, I wouldn't do anything else. And I, awesome. I miss him so much on this mission. He was like, he was the voice for it. Mm -hmm. And I know that his voice will continue to carry. He's left us enough beautiful footage and interviews and quotes and everything that his voice will continue to be heard. And I just wish it was here to keep whispering, you know, like <laughs> maybe not even whispering, just shouting <laughs> in my ear. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that it, it still is here and, and I'm lucky and graced enough to communicate with them on a daily basis. And as weird as that may sound to some, it just, it continues to happen. 
So uh, we'll we'll continue to march forward and put one foot in front of the other, you know. And yeah, for sure. I, I know and I feel like from talking to you that you'll be a big voice in that process. I I'm so stoked to actually so. yeah. get a chance to talk to you and and you Same know here, to see what you're doing and move this thing forward and whatever I can do and we can do to help out with your project. Please count on us. Oh, thanks. That sounds amazing. You know, I wanted to, I interviewed this amazing 25 year old indigenous apprentice from the Amazon. Yeah. And he said to them, because they understand life as fractals. So the universe is your body, your body is the universe, their home is their body. You know, they, they just see no difference between one form of life and the other or one form of matter yes. and the other. And right. so he was like, yeah, I mean, in the jungle where we live, we have one culture. It's just one culture. All of life is one big culture. And that culture just has many natures, you know, to talking about many wow. life forms under one culture. That was so different. Than, yeah. Than How can we implement that on a grander scale into all these other cultures, you know, out into the world? I mean, that uniform kind of philosophy is what we need to impart. And, yeah. and, and like you talked about earlier, to recognize that there is no separation. Everything is delineated into these little boxes of that's this country and in their borders. So that's their issues versus the, the global village and population that we need to surmount all these obstacles and challenges that are presenting themselves. Yeah. And that 25 year old indigenous dude, summed it up very well yeah. <laughs> you know i mean if they have been able to continue that way of life successfully for a long period of time without much external influence from oh. my understanding yeah. you know i mean when you get a chance maybe after after the after shark water extinction launches or something and you have a, about an hour check it out on youtube it's it's in spanish but it has english subtitles and it's just amazing because he's sharing the way they protect all of life in the amazon and they have for thousands of years and so, definitely going to check that out that sounds like a blueprint for yeah. the manual of what yeah. we need to write you know yeah. <laughs> totally yeah uh brock is there anything you'd like to add about robbie or about the film or you'd like to share with people listening well if robbie could share one thing he would say something along the lines of this is the time that we're all gifted in order to find our true gifts and to strive for that beautiful world that we all want to live in and we recognize of course the fact that nobody wants to live in a polluted and exploited environment but it's not going to change unless we do something about it and this is the time this is our opportunity and you know every once in a while a generation is given <laughs> the chance to do something amazing and something great i believe that that is us and this this is our time and it can go one of two ways you know we don't need to talk about the one way but on the other hand this is our real shining moment to stand up and be who we are meant to be and i believe that rob was just a, a real champion for that kind of cause and he he shone the spotlight in the direction in which we can go and i i hope that somehow some way his words and his message and and the words and the message that we all continue to share from his team and his family will help to be a roadmap towards that world that we want to live in fuck yeah <laughs> yes fuck yeah <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> that sounded just like Robbie right there. Yeah. <laughs> you sounded just like him. Yes. Fuck yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean, it's it's interesting talking to you because these are the kind of conversations we would have on long plane trips or on long car rides or you know boat trips out to a site or whatever. It's great talking to you, man. I hope we can continue to talk. It's great and, talking to you. Know, you. It's also the kind of conversation I used to have with him. You know? 
Yeah, yeah. Kindred spirits, you know, like it's it's obvious when you find one that's in the tribe and you figure out yeah. that the mindsets are similar and, and the vibrations just kind of gel into harmony. So it's it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so glad we, we made it and we got the time to, to have this chat um, and and remember Robbie and just celebrate him and celebrate you and, and the whole team at, at Sharkwater. Um, Thanks, brother. I, yeah. I am too. Where can people um, follow you guys? Uh, and where, where, yeah, I know. Website, Instagram. The whole yep. Thing. So the website is uh, www.sharkwater.com. And there's a lot of information up there about the movie and about cool. the movement and what people can do to get involved, which is fantastic. We have awesome. a newsletter that goes out from there. You can sign up to be part of the team. Um, on Instagram, we're at Team Sharkwater. And on Facebook, it's Sharkwater. So you can find us on all the major platforms. It's on Twitter as well. So, you know, I, I don't know if anybody uses Twitter anymore, but it must be out there somewhere. But, you know, yeah. not, not supposed to say that. But, um, yeah, we're up yeah. on Twitter. But, it, you know, you can well, find us all, over all the platforms and stay connected with us. And then please do stay in tuned for the film to come out. It's going to launch at TIFF, as I mentioned, in Toronto. Um, that'll be the premiere of it. It's Rob's hometown, and there will be a That's... massive outpouring of support. It's going to be a wild party, I think. Oh, so awesome! Yeah, Toronto that'll International be great. Film Festival. Yep, right. it's, it's uh, the first weekend in September, and that'll be epic. And then it's going to have a theatrical release uh, starting on October 5th in Canada and in the U.S. And then it'll have you know. Uh, a film festival tour and theatrical releases in Europe shortly thereafter. So we'll, we'll be seeing it around the globe. Keep your eyes peeled for it. You can always stay up to date on the website and on the social media channels. All right, Brock. Well, thank you so much for your time. And yeah, it was awesome to connect with you. Total pleasure. Thanks a lot. Talk soon. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Ciao for now. Bye.